All right, so thank you for having me today. And uh, this is kind of early for me, seven in the morning. But anyway, so let me get started. So the title of my talk today is Classifications of uh, Effective Operators. And uh, first of all, I have to uh, 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 mention that I've been really blessed working with incredible uh, uh, group of people. And this has been a series of papers, uh, as you can see here. And uh, these are pictures of my collaborators Brian Henning, uh, he is right now a postdoc at the University of uh, Geneva in Lausanne. And Xiaoshan Lu is a postdoc at Oregon. Tom, who is one of the organizers here, he is the assistant professor at Calvary APMU. And Lukas Graf, uh, the postdoc at Heidelberg. So uh, the, my, the, the, what, I, what I'm going to talk about today is really based on this uh, incredible group of collaborators. And none of the work I'm going to talk about have been done without them. So. The uh, topic today is effective operators. And uh, the question is, how do we classify them? And this has been a long standing problem since 80s. And it turns out that the main theme I'm gonna talk about today is the conformal field theory actually helps in the standard model, which is actually rather surprising idea. The conformal field theory is of course, has been known to good uh, for describing critical phenomena and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the ADS CFD correspondence and so on and so forth. But it, it turns out that it's actually good for the standard model as well. And, and this idea works for any other renormalizable we we field theory. And I briefly mentioned, I hope that uh, we can apply the similar idea for the Cairo-Lagrangian and there the Hodge theory actually comes into play. And of course, in the end, we need to connect all of these ideas to phenomenology so that that's the the idea uh, for the content of my today's talk. So let me have a brief introduction to this. So uh, we as a community has been uh, really uh, uh, hungry for uh, any hints of new physics beyond the standard model. And uh, we had high, high hopes for the LHC to produce things like supersymmetry, extra dimensions, some candidates for dark matter and so on and so forth. But as we all know, right now there's no sign of new physics. And so uh, that has been a little frustrating. And of course, the OSC has been incredibly successful in discovering the Higgs boson. And that has been, of course, a, in the, uh, uh, the dream for many of us, uh, actually almost for a, a half a century. And it's now there, which is of course, incredible uh, discovery and, and fantastic development. But of course, we would like to see what may actually be on the, uh, the Higgs boson. And especially that Higgs boson is a kind of particle we have never seen before, which looks like an elementary uh, spin zero particle. And uh, the, uh, the, the, because we have never seen a particle like that, we like to understand its context, its actual true nature, uh, why it has a condensate in universe today, and so forth. So there are still many things to be answered beyond discovery. And so far, we haven't understood very much about that. So some people even argued that we are facing a crisis in physics. And so this is an article in Scientific American, this is the cover of it. If supersymmetry doesn't pan out, scientists need a new way to explain the universe. So we will see. So we are definitely. So given that there's no signal of the beyond standard model physics that they would see so far, uh, the idea uh, is that we would like to use effective operators, subject to my uh, talk today, to parameterize the impact of any physics that might exist at higher energies. And uh, we have been talking about this kind of idea for a long time. It comes in the context of, for example, precision electroweak observables, precision Higgs measurements, precision flavor observables, and maybe on a lepton number violation. So uh, the, the, these, uh, the physics, which may come as a correction to the standard model, can be parameterized by effective operators. And once we actually see a deviation from the pure standard model uh, uh, prediction, and that is a hint that, that there's definitely some physics beyond the standard model, and not just knowing that there's something beyond the standard model, we actually understand the uh, energy scale of that, uh, the physics. So that actually gives us a definite idea what energy we should shoot for next. And that's why it will be very important to learn about these effective operators. And in fact, we've been, as a community, through this uh, 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 process before, uh, before we invented the standard model, there was the weak interaction 
described by four fermion operators. And, and that was, uh, so of course, back to Fermi back in uh, uh, 1933 or something. And it took a while uh, for the community to come up with a standard model, which was in uh, uh, 1967, I think, for the Weinberg's paper. So that, that was already like a more than 35 uh, years of uh, journey to go from the four feminine operator to the uh, renormalizable standard model uh, Lagrangian. So uh, it would take a while, but the, the first step was indeed uh, discovering this four fermion operator. So, so the, uh, discovering this effective operator was really the first step towards the, uh, uh, the construction of the standard model. So we are hoping for something similar in this context now, now that the standard model itself is complete, but we are looking for something beyond that. And in fact, uh, one recent example where this idea worked out is the, uh, uh, the look for the correction to the standard model indeed. And we start with the standard model Lagrangian, that's dimension four. Uh, we try to write down dimension five operator suppressed by the one power of high energy scale, dimension six operators are suppressed by two powers of uh, the high energy scale and so on and so forth. And, and, and we can classify them systematically. And that's a subject of my talk uh, later as well. And at the dimension six level, you can have actually many different operators. The first one is relevant to proton decay. Second one is for mu and g minus two. The, this one is for the, uh, uh, the, the triple, anomalous triple gauge boson vertex. This one here is uh, the T parameter in a precision electrical weak. This one here is the S parameter and so on and so forth. So there are actually many, many operators at a dimension six level, but there's only one uh, in the standard model, uh, the correction of the standard model at the dimension five level. So this is the leading operator from physics beyond the standard model one can imagine. And this is LH, the lepton in the Higgs squared. And once you have to substitute the Higgs by its expectation value, this is actually my rudder mass for the neutrinos. So this is the leading correction to the standard model Lagrangian. And indeed, this is the, uh, the, the thing we discovered uh, in the, uh, the, the talk by uh, uh, Takaki Kajita back in uh, 1998. I actually had a pleasure of being there when he presented his results. So it's very exciting. I actually uh, stood up after his talk to give him a standing ovation because you know, this was the moment when I witnessed that the standard model fell there was now something beyond the standard model discovered. Of course, the discovery history of the physics is very uh, uh, strange. For example, you see the, uh, the exclusion limit on the, from various experiments at the stage on this uh, neutron oscillation parameter space, the mixing angle in delta M squared. So these regions were supposed to be excluded, but at the end of the day, this is where it was discovered. And this is now we know that the definitely the parameter space for neutron oscillation is there. And of course, the neutrino physics has been very difficult because of the nature of very rarely interacting uh, neutrinos with the rest of us. But anyway, so this is actually an important thing to remember, you know, where we think uh, the new physics had been excluded, actually maybe where the actual physics lies. So uh, these things actually do, uh, do happen. So that's why the neutrino mass has been uh, important for us because it's lowest order effect of physics at short distances. And in some sense, it's uh, incredible that we actually managed to discover this. Any kinematic effect of the finite mass of the neutrino is suppressed by the mass over energy of the neutrino squared. And we are talking about something like 0.1 eV for like a GeV energy of the neutrinos for the atmospheric or, or accelerator neutrinos. And this quantity is as small as 10 to the minus 20th. So normally we don't think we can actually uh, detect any impact of a small number like this one. But just like we learned also from LIGO uh, recently, the interferometry is a way of looking at the very small numbers. And, and, and uh, to see some small numbers like this, uh, for in the interferometry, you need a coherent source and you need a long baseline and you also need interference. Namely, in this context, it means the last mixing angle. 
and 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 and, it, and it's great that nature somehow had been very nice to us in, in offering all of these conditions. The the, uh, the neutrinos come from many different coherent sources. So atmospheric interaction is one of them. Solar neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, and so on and so forth. And uh, we do have long baseline, namely the size of a planet. That's a long baseline. And for the interference, it requires a large mixing angle. And for some reason, the neutrinos seem to mix a lot. So all these conditions had been satisfied for us. That's why we actually managed to see this incredibly tiny effect at the level of 10 to minus 20th. So we managed to do this neutrino interferometry. That's a neutrino oscillation experiment. And that's why this has been a, uh, the leading order tool to study physics at uh, short distances or high energies. So we've been uh, uh, through this idea that the EFT operators are very uh, uh, effective and useful to understand what's important, what may be less important. And we actually did manage to discover a physics beyond the standard model along this line. So that's why the neutrino physics has been rather uh, 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 exciting uh, field in a, uh, a community. And uh, we are actually probing physics up to 10 to 14, 10 to 15 GeV using the neutrino oscillation experiments. So that brings up this uh, practical question. So once you are given the standard model, now being complete with the discovery of the Higgs boson, you would like to actually write down every possible effective operators that can be added uh, in addition to the standard model Lagrangian at dimension five, dimension six, seven, eight, dot, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's uh, a well-defined uh, question, but it turned out to be so surprisingly difficult. So in the case of the standard model, uh, the Weinberg started to look into the lepton and baryon number violating operators, like my runner mass of the neutrino I mentioned uh, uh, on a previous slide, and also the proton decay operator I also mentioned on the previous slide. So this is where the, uh, the idea that we like to add high dimension operators to the standard model Grandjean started. And uh, later on, uh, the Wilfried uh, Buchmiller and, and Wieler came up with the uh, list of dimension six operators, and they wrote down 80 operators with, for one generation uh, that conserved baryon and epton numbers. But this, these 80 operators actually turned out to be neither complete nor independent. Uh, and and uh, that it took actually a longer time uh, until just uh, 10 years ago to, for the Polish group to come up with the list of all dimension six operators without redundancies. And so that, that actually ended up being uh, 59 operators, uh, the four, uh, even for just one generation with a bearing a left on number conserving. And uh, it took even further uh, time to come up with the classification operators for an arbitrary number of generations, in particular three. And uh, the more recently, they have been attempt to look into the high dimension operators as well. And uh, the, uh, the, you know, at one point, uh, Wilfried Wuchmiller complained to me that uh, his paper was actually not meant to be the idea of classifying operators. They were actually more interested in the flavor physics from short distances. So this was their attempt to just list up the operators they could think of. So it was never intended, actually, being a uh, uh, the classification of operators. So I, I, I believe uh, that, they, that was the intent. But anyway, so that was the beginning of the story. And it took uh, the more than uh, uh, the, the uh, four decades, actually, to come to where we are today. So uh, the, there's a good reason why it took so uh, uh, such a long time to come up with a complete classification of operators. So already at dimension six level, with only one generation, that you have actually uh, quite a few operators, as you can see on this slide. And of course, I will talk about how we came up with this list. And, and uh, so among this list of uh, dimension six operators, uh, these operators actually violate baryon and lepton numbers. And uh, these operators, uh, are, you can see that they are complex conjugate each other. For example, the UC, uh, the UQ H squared H dagger here. And here uh, you see the complex conjugate of that over here and so on and so forth. So uh, if you actually count the Hermitian conjugates as part of a single operator, then you remove the complex conjugates of something you already have. And the rest turns out to be indeed 
59 operators, as the Polish group actually uh, spelled out uh, 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 and, and in 2010. So that's how the, uh, the, you can actually see how rather cumbersome it is to come up with this list of operators. And once you go to dimension eight, there are, are far more operators. It turns out to be there is actually 993 of them, even for a single generation. And once you go to a, a, a three generations, of course, there is a lot more than this. And the reason why it has been so difficult to come up with this list of operators and counting them and classifying them is that there are actually non-trivial redundancies among them. So effective operators, certainly, are invariants under the gauge group, Lorentz group. If you have some additional symmetries in a given theory, you have to impose them as well, including, for example, the parity and charge conjugation and so on and so forth. And so the idea is to come up with a list of operators under a, uh, 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 with a, a particle content you know, and with a, uh, uh, a specific set of uh, underlying symmetries. And the idea of classifying invariants go back to people like Hilbert and Weil and so on and so forth. So it's been a well-known problem in mathematics that's been solved a long time ago. And indeed, the ideas of how to classify them had been already applied to, to uh, for example, superpotentials and superspheric uh, field theories and standard models and so on and so forth. But this old idea of how to classify invariants is just a product of various representations and, and they were not meant to be fields, namely the definition of something being a field is that it is a function of space and time. And if they do not depend on space time, and they are just given by a representation theory of a given uh, symmetry, and the Hilbert vial and so on and so forth had actually worked out all the formalism needed to work out invariants constructed of uh, various uh, combinational representations. So that had been all understood long time ago. But we are dealing with a the field theory and, and everything depends on space and time, which means that we can also think about operators that depend on the derivatives of the fields. So if they are space time constant, derivatives identically vanish, but because the fields are not space time constants, we have to deal with their derivatives as well and the minute you talk about derivatives of the fields, all of a sudden we have to face uh, two sources of the redundancies. The first one is the equation of motion. And once you have a field, and if you have, for example, the Dirac field, and then I gamma del mu minus m acting on a Dirac field is identically zero. And uh, even though we are talking about operators, which uh, can be defined off shell, at the end of the day, we are all, always looking for uh, the consequence of them in terms of the physical processes where you actually compute the S matrix elements, namely the scattering cross section. And so the equation motion do come into place uh, for the on shell states and therefore uh, that would lead to redundancies in operators. Another source of redundancy is the integration by parts. And uh, the, of course, for the, uh, the Lagrangians, uh, of course, we are looking at Lagrangian density uh, for the Lorentz invariant uh, field theories. And uh, the, uh, part, uh, the total derivative terms in the Lagrangian uh, do not change physics, uh, at least at the classical level in equation motion. And at the quantum level, of course, we can think about that in the in context of things like the theta term in QCD. But at least, again, for the purpose of perturbative expansion and the working of S matrix elements, the total derivatives do not matter. And therefore, they, if two operators are related by integration by parts, they, are, uh, they give you identical physics, and hence the redundancies. So we have to address these two sources of redundancies when we try to come up with a classification of independent and complete set of uh, operators. So just to uh, 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 amplify this point that these redundancies are non-trivial, think about the sort of the easiest problem we can think about. So let's imagine that you're talking about this four point function among the scalar particles. And we would like to uh, understand the dimension six operators, namely that, that these are operators uh, that appear with the two powers of the derivatives or two powers of momenta 
of external lines. And it turns out that because we are dealing with four independent particles, so I'm assuming here that they are not identical to simplify discussions, uh, immediately you can come up with the 10 operators. So here I have two derivative acts in one field together with the three other fields. And here I distributed two derivatives on two fields together with two other fields without derivatives. So here you count immediately, there are 10 operators you can write down. But for the first class of operators, this del mu del mu is basically the Lambertian and the equation of motion turns the Lambertian into mass squared. So uh, this actually reduced to the dimension four operators once you use this equation of motion. So when you're classifying dimension six operators, they have been already counted at the dimension four level. So they have to be removed. So you have to subtract four of them. And at the dimension six level, namely that the amplitudes with the two powers of momenta, the Lorentz invariance tells you that there are only three Lorentz invariant combinations, namely three Mandelstam variables of S, T, and U. And in addition, uh, Mandelstam variables are subject to the constraint that some of them, X plus T plus U, are given by the sum of the mass squared of external lines. So it turns out that there are only two independent linear combinations out of the remaining six over here. So we have to still remove four more combinations uh, out of this initial 10 set of operators. And so they are indeed done by the integration by parts. So you have to actually work out rather uh, uh, the non-trivial operator relations like this one so that you can remove the remaining four. So these are the, uh, the operator relations which are actually given uh, uh, as a identical to uh, uh, zero uh, due to the integration by parts. So after going through these uh, non-trivial operator ident identities, you indeed can remove four out of the room six and you find only two independent operators at the end of the day. And remember, this is the simplest example I could think of. And, and already you see these non-trivial subtle uh, uh, redundancies going on and uh, uh, so that's what we have to face in, in terms of classifying operators at any dimensionality uh, of the effective operators. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's something we really have to uh, think about. And in addition, uh, there are only D, this is a space-time dimension, linearly independent momenta in D dimensions uh, for higher point functions. So uh, uh, the, the problem turns out to be rather uh, intricate and complicated. And uh, when we actually started to look into this problem, uh, 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 initially uh, by, uh, together with uh, Brian Henning and the Shaoshan Lu and Tom Melia, uh, so uh, we wanted to simplify the problem and look at the simplest case we could think of, namely that it was not even quantum field theory. So it's a 1D space time, namely that the quantum field theory reduces the quantum mechanics. Therefore, there's only one type of derivative namely the time derivative. And for a free particle uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, x double dot, that's uh, uh, according to Newton, so that's acceleration, which is given by the force. And for a free particle, there's no force and therefore x double dot vanishes. So the particles undergo a constant motion. So that's the simplest thing that we could think of. So uh, if you think of the blocks of, uh, the building blocks of the operators, the x or the coordinate or phi, if you like, is of course the part of the building blocks and x dot is also a part of the building block. But when you go to x double dot, that vanishes by the equation of motion. So uh, we are looking at the polynomials built out of x and x dot. So that's how we can get started. And if you think about, for example, two different coordinates like x and y for a, a point particle, we have x and x dot y and y dot as the building blocks of operators and, and x double dot and y double dot uh, are, are vanished identically because of the equation of motion. So we already uh, to, uh, taken care of them. And then uh, if you classify uh, arbitrary operators built of x and y, then of course two times two is four. So you have these uh, four different uh, operators uh, you can think of. And one combination of the cross product x y dot plus y x dot is actually a total derivative of x y. 
And if you further take a time derivative of this one, the x, y double dot vanishes because of the equation of motion. And uh, the, uh, the x double dot y also vanishes because of the equation of motion. So the only piece that remains is x dot y dot as the total derivative of this uh, second line. And maybe I should have put a factor two here. So this is two x dot y dot. And so the second one and third one are total derivative operators, which descend from the first operator x, y. So the second and third should be removed for more counting of operators. But for the rest of the second line, you have the opposite linear combination of them, x, y dot minus y, uh, x dot y. And this cannot be written as a total derivative of uh, something else. And therefore this needs to be included in the counting of operators. So uh, at this level, we actually have two independent operators, x, y and x, y dot minus uh, x dot y. But when you actually look at this, uh, uh, the, 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 the combination, you already see there's something has to do, uh, so this is the reason why they have to be removed, but something has to do with the uh, SU2-like structure or SL2 uh, to, to be more precise. And, and, and in retrospect, this was the first sign that the conformal field theory is useful for this purpose. So SL2R, which gives you the structure of the doublet and triplet and so on and so forth, actually is a conformal group of one dimensional space time. So uh, in general, for D dimensional space time, the conformal group is given by SO1 D plus one. So when you have one dimensional space time for the case of quantum mechanics, D is one, therefore you are dealing with SO1 two, that's nothing but SL2R. And that's the, the group we actually are, are, are looking at right here. So this was the first hint that the conformal group has something to do with the idea of classifying operators. So uh, in retrospect, uh, in some sense, this was obvious, but it took a, a while for us to recognize this point. So if you regard any renormalizable quantum field theories, uh, then you start with the kinetic terms as a zero order Lagrangian, and they are given by, for example, this for the klein gordon field, for Dirac field, and, 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 and the base field, and so on. And all of these terms are conformally invariant. In the case of four-dimensional state time, that is, of course, given by SO4, comma 2, or if you complicify this, this is SO6. And in addition, the conformal field theory has this amazing property of the operator state correspondence. So when you're looking at the operators, you can look at states instead, namely that you can look at the representation theory of the conformal group. And in the representation theory of the conformal uh, groups, the equation motion is something well known as what is called a short multiplets, namely that if you actually build a representation, a reducible representation from a certain highest weight state, and then you find a null state uh, in the course of building it up. And, and once you have actually these null states, they correspond to the zero operator from the equation of motion. So that this actually is a well-known subject. And in addition, the total derivatives are nothing but the uh, descendants. So in a conformal field theory, you start with a primary states or primary operators, which correspond to the highest weight state of the representation theory. And the primary states are not what can be written as a total derivative. <coughs> but all the other higher states can be written as a total derivatives. So the uh, idea of keeping only operators which cannot be written as a total derivatives actually turned out to reduce to the problem of just identify the primary states, in other words, highest weight states, of a given irreducible representation. So the counting operators, which are not total derivatives, actually turn out to be the same problem of listing up the highest weight states in the conformal field theory. So that's how we came up with the idea of using that. So at the end of the day, so here's the master formula. So what we would like to do is to write down the Hilbert series, which is nothing but the generating function 
of all possible operators in a given uh, quantum field theory. And uh, the, uh, so the Hilbert series is given in terms of the power series of the operators you have in your theory. So in the standard model, of course, we know what the particle content is, so we know what they are. And together with the arbitrary powers of the derivatives acting on them. So we are looking at the uh, generating function, which is a function of powers of derivatives and powers of the, the fields you have in a given theory. And in order to count invariance under gauge symmetries, of course, that's a, 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 we have to look at the gauge invariant operators. All you have to do is to multiply various, uh, the representation of a gauge group, namely that we are looking at the characters under the, the gauge symmetry, and you multiply them, and then you integrate over the measure of the gauge symmetry called the Haar measure, and once you actually do this integral over the Haar measure, the only thing that remains in the end are the invariants under the gauge group. And in addition, we also perform integral over the Haar measure of the conformal group, and the conformal group includes Lorentz uh, group, and so uh, end result have to be Lorentz invariant, and the uh, Haar measure integral actually automatically gives you Lorentz invariance. But if you also extend this uh, Haar measure into the conformal group beyond the Lorentz invariance, then at the end of the day, you are only counting the, uh, the combinations that give you the highest weights under the conformal groups, and therefore only primary operators, and hence non-total derivative operators. So that's the way you can come up with this uh, Hilbert series that generates all operators you need in a given quantum field theory. So you find a, a function of these fields and powers of derivatives. And once you actually expand this out in the power series, you find the set of operators at a given dimensionality. So, uh, uh, so that's what we would like to perform. And one little complication here is what is called the platistic exponentials. So when you actually consider the higher powers of the given operator, then you have to face the fact that the bosons operate, uh, they are, have to be totally symmetric under interchange among them. The fermions have to be totally antisymmetric, the interchange among them. So that actually gives you this extra constraint that we have to uh, deal with this uh, platistic exponential. I will come back and talk about that in, in a moment. But anyway, so that gives you the basic idea how we can do this, namely that you try to come up with this uh, Hilbert series as a generating function of all possible operators given a particle content, but together with possible derivatives. So that's what Hilbert and Weil didn't do uh, back in the early 20th century. And so now we need to dis include these derivatives. And then the idea is that you just multiply a bunch of characters on top of each other under a given symmetry. And then you've performed this, uh, uh, the Haar measure integrals for the gauge group and conformal groups, then you are done. So that's the, the basic idea. But I have to explain a little bit more about this machinery involved in this. So the first thing, of course, is Lorentz invariance. And we all know from the, 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 the quantum field theory class that the Lorentz uh, invariance is SO3, comma 1. And once you actually do the weak rotation, that's SO4 which is identical to SU2 cos SU2 mod Z2. So we can label uh, every useful uh, representation of our Lorentz group in terms of the, uh, the spins of the first SU2 and the second SU2, namely you specify J1 and J2. And the scalar field corresponds to zero, zero representation. The wire fermions are either half zero or zero half. And the uh, uh, vector field, like a vector potential, is half half. Uh, on the other hand, the field strength are actually one zero or zero one. So uh, here I have a typo. This has to be minus sign here. So f plus f dual, namely self dual combination, is one zero. F minus f dual, anti self dual combination, is zero one. So these are the building blocks of uh, writing down the Hilbert series. And, and just in case that you haven't seen the character in, in, in group theory uh, 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 recently, so it's just a very brief review of this. So character is a function of the parameters of a given group, and we can always specify the parameters up to the number of rank of a given group. 
and a character is defined to be just a trace of the, uh, the, the group element in a given representation. And, and so this is the definition of the character. And because this is a trace, so this object is invariant under the conjugation. So in the case of SU2, uh, what is invariant under conjugation uh, is actually just a diagonal form of a given matrix. So we can always diagonalize arbitrary SU2 matrix into the form given only by this uh, Cartan element. And so uh, the Cartan element has the eigenvalue of j, j minus one, dot, 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 minus j. So, uh, and, and, and rank of SU2 is only one. So there's only single property you have to specify, which is the angle of rotation. Then the diagonal uh, form of the SU2 matrix is given by basically these, uh, 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 the phases. And so it's just a simplified notation. I'm gonna call e to the i theta over two as y, so that e to the i j theta is y to the two j, e to the i j minus one theta is y to the two j minus two, and uh, dot, 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 we go to e to the minus i j theta, that's the y to minus two j. So these are the elements that go into the characters. So therefore, all, all you need to do is sum them up. So the character in this representation of spin j, therefore is given by the sum of these uh, diagonal elements, and this is just a geometric series, so you can easily sum them up. And so you end up with this form. And uh, these characters turned out to be orthonormal uh, on the Haar measure integrals. So if you actually have characters of one representation of one J and character of another representation of the other J, and if you do the integral over this Haar measure, then they are orthonormal, namely that different characters are orthogonal to each other, so they give you zero. And the same character uh, gives you one because it's already normalized. So hence, everything is orthonormal. So this is the property that actually just turns out to be very useful when you actually construct invariance. So that's the idea of the characters. And of course, for the Lorentz group, they, it's a little bit more complicated because you have SU2 cos SU2, but the idea is the same. So when you actually have, for example, the uh, the the uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the the scalar field, the value fields, and the gauge fields, then you can come up with the corresponding characters under the uh, Lorentz symmetry. So that, that's the idea down here. And of course, as I mentioned already, we like to expand this idea to the full conformal group beyond the Lorentz group, and that's the largest symmetry you can have for the Minkowski space-time. And for D-dimensional space-time, the conformal group is SOD comma two. So in addition to the Lorentz group generators, uh, that includes also translation and also uh, the dilatation, which is just a overall scaling of the space-time coordinates. And you also have these special conformal uh, symmetries, namely that you invert space-time coordinate, you translate, and then you invert it back, and that gives you this kind of the infinitesimal transformation. So the the, uh, the the set of all these different symmetries form the conformal symmetry, and you have a d plus one, d plus two over two generators of the conformal group for d-dimensional space time. And the reason why this conformal group is important for us, as I said already, is that you have primary states which cannot be written as a total derivative. And all the other states can be written as the derivatives acting on the primary states. So that's why uh, we can actually use this idea of a conformal symmetry. And in the end, we just count these highest weight states of the re irreducible representations of the conformal symmetry. And so in addition to the Lorentz generators M mu nu, the P mu are the generators of the translation. And D is a generator of dilatation, namely scale invariance. And in addition, we have these additional generators called K mu for the special conformal uh, 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 symmetries. And they satisfy these, uh, uh, the D algebra. And the K mu annihilates the highest weight state. So that's the idea of the primary states in the representation theory of the conformal group. And the dilatation operator has an eigenvalue that's a conformal weight of this highest weight state. 
in addition, you have to specify the, the, the Lorentz representation given by these two sets of the uh, angular momenta, J1 and J2. So that's how you specify the highest weight state. And the, all the other states in a given representation uh, can be constructed by acting the P mu, namely derivatives on this highest weight state. So that's why uh, in the end, you, don't, you are not interested in all of these uh, uh, high, uh, the, uh, the descendant states because we are looking at operators which cannot be written as a total derivative. So identifying these highest weight states for a given conformal weight uh, and the Lorentz representation is the way to look for the uh, 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 non-redundant set of operators. So uh, here are the building blocks. Uh, if you have a field theory, you can have the scalar field, you can have y fermions, and the complex conjugates have to be treated independently from the, the, the fermions themselves. And here you have the self-dual and anti-self-dual combination of the field strength. And dealing with the vector potential is not very useful because of the gauge redundancies. That's why we are actually uh, dealing with the field strength instead. And uh, we construct something we call the single particle module, namely that once you have a field, you have the complete set of uh, operators which come with the uh, all uh, set of the derivatives acting on them. And as I emphasized already, I'm only interested in this top element, highest weight state phi, but we also of course need to know how these uh, the derivatives act on this field. And so the entirety of these uh, field and their derivatives is what we call the single particle module. So, uh, uh, just, so the schematically, uh, things go something like this for the representation theory of the conformal group you first come up with the highest weight state, which has a certain uh, irreducible representation on the Lorentz group. So the highest weight state is already a multiplet on the Lorentz group. For example, you have two states for the wire fermion and so on and so forth. And, and all of these, uh, the higher states with the higher conformal weights uh, come with acting derivatives on these, uh, the, the highest weight states, which is at the bottom. And in some uh, combination, you actually find zero because they correspond to the equation of state. Uh, so certain combination of derivatives give you identically zero because the field operator satisfies the equation of uh, uh, the uh, equation of motion, uh, and and therefore they are said to be zero. They are null states, and when these null states can appear in a given module, has been already uh, classified, and namely that those modules which contain these uh, null states are called the short multiplets. And for short multiplets, we can actually write down the uh, characters under the conformal group, which are yet to be integrated of the Haar measure to give you invariance. And here it looks a little bit complicated, but the idea is that you have an arbitrary power of derivatives and derivative is a Lorentz vector. And Lorentz vector is one half, one half, as far as the representation theory goes. So I have to specify two numbers for a uh, given character. So here I have two numbers, alpha and beta, which corresponds to the phase factor for each of the SU2 factors in the Lorentz group. And so to generate arbitrary powers of space-time derivatives, I have these four combinations, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, inverse, alpha inverse beta, alpha inverse beta inverse. So they correspond to the four components of the Lorentz vector of the space-time derivative. And each derivative should be counted in power series in Q uh, in this notation here. So the power series expansion Q is the same thing as expanding in a power series of the derivatives. So that's a derivative expansion in a given field theory. And it is also known when you can encounter these short multiplets where you find null states that correspond to the equation of motion. And that happens when the conformal weight is given by one plus J1 plus J2, whenever a J1, J2 vanishes. So the short multiplets have this additional constraint of the equation of motion. Therefore, one combination at the level of two derivatives for the Klein-Gordon field gives you null state. So that's why you actually have one, which corresponds to the field itself, and Q squared, 
that corresponds to the Lambertian of phi. So you have to actually impose the constraint that the Lambertian basically gives you zero. Of course, for massive field that turns into m squared phi, but that have been already counted at the lower uh, the, uh, dimensionality. So you can nicely set it to zero for the purpose of counting. So you place this additional constraint that q squared actually gives you one. So that actually is the, uh, the numerator as, uh, as you see on the later uh, slides. So you put one minus q squared as a constraint. Then you do the same thing for the bio field. So in this case, the field itself uh, is the half one. So that means you have the character that given by alpha and alpha inverse corresponding to the power series in the uh, eigenvalue of this SU2 right, but singlet and the SU2 left. And the Dirac operator corresponds to the first power in the uh, derivative. And once you act this Dirac operator, the right-handed field turns into the left-handed field, and therefore they come with the, the beta for the second SU2 factor instead. So that's the character for the Dirac field. And this is the character for the field strength. So the field strength as I said, is one zero representation. So that comes with alpha squared one and alpha squared inverse. And del mu f mu nu identically vanishes uh, either by Bianchi identity or equation of motion. So the, that constraint is implemented uh, in this fashion because the del mu f mu nu is a Lorentz vector with the women nu index. That's one half, one half representation and hence alpha plus alpha inverse times delta plus beta inverse with the first power of derivative. If you go to second power derivative, you find a combination that identically vanishes because of the anti-symmetry of the field strength in mu nu indices. So that is also a constraint. So you actually implement these constraints in terms of the characters. And then you look at the Hilbert series. So once you have a field phi, you look at the arbitrary polynomials in phi. So this is actually what is called the freely generated ring from the, uh, the, the, the point of view of math mathematics of the uh, commutative rings. So the, all of these things can be generated by this generating function of one over one minus phi. Namely, by just expanding this in power series in phi, you generate all of these operators on its way. So that's the idea of the Hilbert series being the generating function. But if you have something which is a constraint on this, for example, if you're looking at the fermion, which is anti-symmetric, then the Grassmann operator squared is identically vanishing. So that's a constraint you can impose. And the way you can impose constraint is put that into the numerator in a Hilbert series. So phi squared vanishes. That's how you actually put this numerator that phi squared uh, minus one uh, is, is what implements the constraint. And together with this freely generated ring of the one over one minus phi, this thing is actually can be written out. It's just one plus phi. And then you see that the, uh, the constraint is correctly implemented, namely that the Hilbert series truncates uh, at the first order in phi, the second order and beyond are not there because of this constraint. So that's the idea. So the freely generated uh, the ring of operators is given by this just one over one minus operator, but you put this constraint in numerator uh, for whatever field you got uh, to uh, avoid redundancies. So this is how you can in, uh, encode all possible operators in a given theory by just doing a power series expansion of this generating function, namely the Hilbert series. So as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, we have to implement also the nature of the Bose statistics, namely the operators have to be totally uh, symmetric under the interchange. So that is conveniently done by what is called the platistic exponential, which is basically given by this combination of one over determinant in a given representation of one minus u g. G is the, uh, the, the unitary matrix of the uh, in a given representation. So this expression uh, is probably familiar to you from the path integral of the boson field. And so that is what is actually being used for this purpose as well. So again, just to give you an idea how this uh, platistic exponential works, again, looking at the case of uh, spin one half representation of SU2. So this by definition is actually determinant of this matrix in a denominator. 
And uh, for the SU2 representation of the doublet, uh, you have eigenvalue y and y inverse in a doublet representation. And so that is determinant is just given by this. And if you expand this in power series in U, then you find the singlet, doublet, triplet, quadruplet, and so on and so forth. So they all correspond to the totally symmetric product of uh, spin one half representation for bosons. And that's how you know that the statistical exponential is indeed the right way of counting the, uh, uh, the operators, which is a totally symmetric product of a doublet representation in this case. And for the fermion, you have to anti-symmetrize them. And again, from the uh, uh, intuition from the path integral and field theory, it should reduce the determinant rather than inverse determinant. And indeed, that inverse uh, determinant actually does give you the correct uh, the Hilbert series. So again, uh, looking at the spin one half case as an example, determinant is given by this combination and, and it can be expanded fully because it truncates at the second power in U being the two by two matrix. And, and the, uh, the expansion is given by this. So you see that, that you have a singlet to begin with and you have a doublet and the anti-symmetric product of uh, doublets is singlet at the second power. And you do not have any higher powers because a doublet has only two independent components. If you anti-symmetrize them, then there's no third power in beyond. So that is the, the, the full complete expression of the generating function. And hence this actually uh, takes care of the Fermi statistics properly. So this is the idea of what is called the platistic exponential, which allows us to encode totally and total symmetry or total anti-symmetry uh, in terms of these uh, determinants. And as I also mentioned earlier, to build invariance, you actually integrate over the harm measures. And so you have to do this for the conformal group. And I realized that I'm actually going too slowly. I got only six minutes left. So I don't go through details here, but this is actually totally well known in the math literature, how to write down the harm measures. So once again, here's the master formula. You take a product of all these characters in a given representation of the Lorentz group and gauge group. You have total symmetrization or anti-symmetrization using this platonic exponential. <clears throat> and in the end, you actually project this to only singlets at the end of the day with a certain given power of the derivatives. And once you actually do the power series expansion of this in power series in Q, that generates all operators you need. And uh, of course, the obvious application is to the standard model to come up with the SMEF standard model effective field theory. So you assign all of these characters for a given representation of the fields under Lorentz group and gauge groups, and you take the product of them and with a plus exponential. And uh, the, the Tom is the person who actually wrote this form program. And dimension six, six operators can be classified in just a bit more than one second, which took for the community three decades to work out. And once you go to dimension eight, it takes a, a little bit longer, but idea is still the same. You first write down all of these characters for the standard model particle content. You build the plastic exponential and the harm measure integral actually turns out to be basically the residue integral in a complex plane. So you just identify a piece, which is only one power of the pole downstairs. So that's something easy to do. And in 22 seconds, we come up with this complete setup of the dimension eight operators in this case for a single gener uh, generation. And you can do that also for the three generations of the standard model. And that you can come up with all this counting of effective operators uh, at any mass dimension of the operator. And uh, this you can see is an exponential rise. This is a log, uh, log plot. And this exponential rise can be understood in some sense as an entropy uh, according to Cardi's entropy formula for a given uh, particle content. And uh, the Tom and the Powell actually came up with more detailed uh, discussion on this problem just the last year. So you understand this asymptotic behavior of this exponential growth uh, very well. In addition, in some cases, you would like to also implement discrete space-time symmetries, which we figured out only the last year under the parity and charge conjugation. So in the case of parity, if you have the, uh, the odd dimensional space-time, the parity by changing sign of only one of the component is actually equivalent 
of changing sign of all components of vector because you have the, uh, uh, the space time rotation that can change the signs of all two R even number of coordinates. And therefore parity is actually not really a space time symmetry it turns out. It's just a Z2 external discrete symmetry on the field. And to, to count, to, to build a Hilbert series, all you need to do is just separate out the even power of the field because of this negative sign, which is just the average of the Hilbert series of phi and Hilbert series of minus phi. So this averaging actually turns out to be a useful context uh, con concept, even when you do have a non-trivial space-time symmetry. So in the case of SO2R in even dimensional space-time, the parity actually turns out to be an auto automorphism of the, 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 the Lorentz group. And under the parity, you flip one, the sign of only one of the elements of the vector. So the invariant subgroup of the Lorentz group is SO2R minus one. And uh, so this procedure of going from SO2R to SO2R minus one under parity is actually given by the folding of thinking diagram. So for SO2R, you have this D series of D algebra, which has a symmetry of interchanging this circle and that circle by the inversion. So folding means you identify these two circles that actually gives you a slightly smaller thinking diagram that corresponds to SO2R minus one. But it turns out that for the purpose of working out the characters, you take the dual of SO2R minus one, that's SP2R minus two in C series. So it turns out that this actually is a relatively new mathematics, which had been worked out only in 1996 by these people. And the characters under the parity art element is called the twining characters. So that, this is a notation for SO2R rotation. You can have this R uh, independent phases, which we parameterize into these X's. So each of the X is just a phase factor. And, and just an example, if you look at the character of the adjoint representation, it can be written this way. And under the invariant subgroup under parity, uh, the last element of X has to be just one. And, and then this SO2R characters decomposes into the adjoint representation or the vector representation of SO2R minus one. And here are the characters. But when you look at the parity odd element of SO2R or O2R, uh, now that parity is included, then you actually take the difference between them because the vector under SO2R minus one uh, actually is an odd under parity. So once you actually do the subtraction to define the character for the odd element, this piece here completely cancels. You end up with this expression, which turns out to be nothing but a character for the second rank antisymmetric tensor in SP group. So, and, and you also extend this idea to charge conjugation. So for SU2K group, charge conjugation is defined by this symplectic matrix because this combination does satisfy the same V algebra as the previous V algebra. So the invariant subgroup then is SP2K and it's dual is SO2K plus one. And so this dual is not even a subgroup of the original group SU, but this is actually the way you can uh, classify the characters. So once again, just a notation given by all of these diagonal elements, substitute the traceless constraint or the special uh, unitary matrix. And uh, again, looking at the example of SU2 groups, uh, it turns out that SU2 group of the adjoint representation would decompose this into symmetric and anti-symmetric tensor under the invariant SP uh, groups. And here is the character. And once again, we look actually at the odd elements and odd elements, the difference between symmetric and anti-symmetric, which turns out to be just the character of the vector representation of SO. Uh, once again, this is not even subgroup of SU2, but that, that's the character that shows up. An interesting thing is that if you look at the SU odd group, that's A2K, uh, charge conjugation again is an auto automorphism given by this combination. Invariant subgroup is uh, SO2K plus one, it's dual is SP. But if you look at the Wiki Wikipedia, they explicitly state the automorphism of A2N, namely SU odd, does not yield a folding because the middle two nodes are connected by an edge, but in the same orbit. So they say, the folding is not possible, but it turns out it is possible. And that is what is actually worked out in the paper I mentioned. 
And uh, I have to go quickly here. So once again, you see this idea that the parity odd elements has a character given by this uh, a dual of the invariant subgroup SP in this case. So once you know that these are uh, 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 the characters under the, uh, 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 the odd elements of parity and charge conjugation, you know the characters, you know the, the uh, Haar measure, and therefore you can work out the Hilbert series. So that's why you can actually work everything out. And now I ran out of time, so I don't have time to talk about the Cairo Lagrangian, which we also managed to work out fully. And then also you then will need to understand how actually end up using the effective field theory to work out the physical observables. You also need to understand how to match UV theory to the IR EFT. And we worked out a formalism called the covariant derivative expansion to simplify the process. And once you have the uh, all sets of effective operators, in the end, of course, you would like to measure them. And that's why I'm proposing, uh, propose, uh, the promoting the idea of going to the uh, another accelerator. So LHC, of course, is the energy frontier. And we are looking for some holy grail of new physics at high energies. But having not seen any sight of the high, uh, the, the corrections of the standard model so far, now that there is a cloud gathering, and the idea of E plus C minus machine with the precision measurements is that we can peek through this cloud and, and in terms of EFT. And that's what we would like to do experimentally. And in addition to that, of course, you have all uh, uh, access to all other new physics. Uh, uh, you can study at the relatively low energy scale, but we decouple. And that's how we hope we can understand something beyond the standard model in the near future. So uh, that is end of my talk today. And sorry, I went over four minutes, uh, but anyway, that's